Um, <coughs> so hopefully some of you might have heard or seen uh, my little Pong project back in April of this year uh, for the Philly Tech Week. Um, and I thought I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about the years leading up to that project and the lessons that I learned um, through that process and sort of share that insight with you as well. So it all began when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley from 1986 to 1994. So if you actually do the math, yes, I loved Berkeley so much that I was an undergraduate for eight years. <laughs> now, one night in 1988, I was driving across the Bay Bridge, which goes from Berkeley to San Francisco at night to meet some friends at San Francisco, in San Francisco. Now, I've done this trip many times before, you know, without really thinking too much about it. But this night, for whatever reason, as I was going across, I was looking at the skyline of San Francisco, as you see here, and instead of just seeing the lights of the building, what I saw were the lights taking shapes, Tetris shapes, to be precise, rotating and falling. Now, this being Berkeley, after all, all I could think of at the moment was that I should try to avoid my roommate's secondhand smoke from this point on. So fast forward to 2008. The building you see on the left, obviously, is the Sears Center building. This is a 29-story building that was built in about 2005. Um, it's about 450 foot tall, and it's located right next to the 30th, st 30th station. It's owned and operated by Brandywine Realty Trust. Again, 20 years later, from 1998 to 2008, I was driving down I-76 at night, as I was going past the Sears Center, at this time, much like back in 1998, I saw the lights, and other times I, when I passed by, you know, I really didn't think too much about it. But this time, like before, I saw Tetris shapes were forming, rotating and falling. Now, <clears throat> rather than, um, again, of course, these are lights that I saw in my mind's eye, not the actual physical building itself. But rather than just, you know, essentially uh, uh, kind of forgetting about it, this time as a faculty and as a founder of game design, the initial idea that I had was, you know, wouldn't it be cool to try to make a game with those lights? So that was back in 2008. So here's the first lesson that I, want, I learned that I wanted to essentially get across. That is, wouldn't it be cool, dot, dot, dot. That is, if you ever find yourself asking the question, wouldn't it be cool, dot, 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 grab that idea and run with it. Because I firmly believe that that simple question is the basis of all innovation and of all innovation and ideas. So I don't know for sure, but I would like to think that there was a person back in 1900s that perhaps was asking himself, wouldn't it be cool to broadcast moving images across a distance? Or perhaps someone asking himself, wouldn't it be cool to send a person to the moon? Or perhaps someone asking himself, wouldn't it be cool to have something that works both as a fork and a, spork, uh, and a spoon? Um, so returning to my story, uh, in 2008 was when I initially had the idea of making a game with the Sears Center lights. I didn't know anyone at Brand New Iron Realty Trust, so my idea was to basically try to look for people, um, try to look for people that I knew that might know someone at Brandywine or that I knew that might know someone that might know someone at Brandywine. So basically the whole point was to talk to everyone and everyone, anyone that I can to try to essentially get a message through Brandywine and have them contact me. Now initially I thought, well, you know, it will take a week, maybe a month because such a cool idea to make a game with those lights that I was just waiting by the phone. Then one year passed, uh, 2009, another year passed, 2010. Finally in 2010, through a connection that I had with the Philadelphia city government, I finally got a meeting with one of the senior executives at Brandywine Realty Trust. Now, I felt that this was my chance to really wow them. That is, if I could just show them what was in my mind, uh, as scary that might be, if I could just show them what was in my mind, 
that they would just fall over themselves because they, I, would, I could convince that this was such a cool idea. So in doing so, I figure uh, I want to I create some concept images that I showed them of what some of these games might look like. So here are the original concept sketches that I actually showed them back in 2010 of what Tetris might look like on the Shear Center. So again, this isn't actual lights, but these are essentially concept images that we created through Photoshop. And this here are the concept sketches of what Palm on the Sirius Center might look like. Again, this is not real, but it's basically, um, you know, essentially what, well, I can see what it might, be, it might look like. So with these photos, I basically went, so after showing them the concept images, I went for the kill. Basically, I told them, imagine the CEO of Brandywine Realty Trust and the mayor of Philadelphia walking up the steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum. The same steps that Rocky ran up as well. Now imagine the cameras from both local, national, and international press rolling and taking pictures as the two step up, the CEO and the mayor step up to eight foot replica of Atari 2600 joystick to play the world's biggest game of Pong. That was my pitch, that was my sell point. Now, I told him also that this would be a celebration of the creativity and the technological innovation of the city of Philadelphia brought about by a close collaboration between the city government, Philadelphia, industry, Brandywine, and like academia, Drexel. So I thought you know, this was a done deal. This, there's no, no one would lose on this, uh, uh, with this deal. And I finally told him that this will bring tremendous amount of positive press, not only to the city, but for Brandywine as well. He said he'll think about it and contact me. I figured this was a home run. You know, this was done. <laughs> um, I mean, how can you not see how cool this idea was? So I figured I would get a call the next day. So I waited and waited and waited some more and waited. And much like this slide, my mind went blank because I couldn't believe uh, what he was saying. I finally contacted him and he basically said no. And the reason was Pong and Tetris, the images that I showed, were, were old games. Why would people care about old games? And that just shocked me. I mean, I just couldn't, you know, essentially I, I had to lift the, I, my, my chin off the floor because I, after gathering my thoughts, I tried to convince him, you know, people care that it's Pong and Tetris. Pong and Tetris are not just a milestones in gaming, but they're milestones in our culture. Pong was the very first successful video game. It launched our industry. I mean, people like myself at my age grew up playing Pong and Tetris. But people young and old who've never played Pong and Tetris have heard of Pong and Tetris. And they're part of our culture. And that was my argument. Needless to say, I was deeply disappointed, but I didn't want to give up. I felt like, uh, with these slides automatically going on its own speed, I felt like that if I could just get to the person at the top, that I could convince him to let me do this. So I began again talking to people around me to try to talk to other people around them, to try to talk to other people around them, to finally get to um, the CEO and the president of, of Brand New Realty Trust, Jerry Sweeney. So I waited and waited a little bit more. And in 2012, I finally got a chance to talk to uh, Drexel University President John Fry. Um, I had a meeting with him. He asked, I talked to him about the project a number of times before. He asked how it was going. I told him it wasn't going really anywhere at all. So he then said that, why don't I make an introduction for you, between you and, and Jerry? Um, I said, yes, that's great. After five years, it's finally moving along. So. After, um, after President Fry made the initial contact, I began sending Jerry email um, once every month, about three or four emails across those number of months. I finally got a response from him, response from him in November of 2012. Um, and uh, he basically replied that by first saying that he appreciated the fact that I was persistent but polite. 
Um, and would I like to meet? And I said, yes. Which takes me to the second lesson that I learned. That is, be persistent but polite. That is, in pursuing your vision, uh, be persistent in pursuing your vision or dream, but be polite about it. Because believe in your dream and vision, and sooner or later, other people will believe in them as well, as long as you're polite. Um, whether that's the truism or not, at least certainly it's a, it's a lesson that I've sort of taken to heart. So back in 2000, oh, so in 2013, January 31st, I remember the day quite well, I finally had my first meeting with Jerry Sweeney face to face. So that's basically January of this year. We met for about 30 minutes, which we spent 20 minutes just chatting. In the last 10 minutes, he asked me what I wanted to do. So for 10 minutes, I explained, I want to create a video game with the Serious Sense of Lights. And as soon as I was finished explaining after 10 minutes, he said, great, that sounds very creative, let's go for it. And that was it. After five years, that was the answer that I got. So again, I left that meeting stunned and my mind sort of blank at the same time. But this time it was for good, uh, in a good way. Finally, after five years, I was able to move forward with my dream and vision to create a game using this area center, using the building. But on the other side, if you actually do the math, this is the end of January and Philly Tech Week was April, I had two months from scratch to do this project. So certainly, I was, I was very trepidatious and so on uh, during that time. So if you actually, uh, if you have received the initial Philly Tech Week announcements, what it indicated was something very vague, that there might be an interactive art project that might be announced. Because I kept delaying actually confirming that I'll participate in Philly Tech Week until I could feel like I could deliver that you know, I could do the task, do the project. So I kept pushing off, pushing off until end of March. That's when I finally confirmed to Philly Tech Week that I will participate in um, uh, the Philly Tech Week. And the actual formal announcement to the press was sent out April 3rd. So that's cutting deadline very, very thin, I must say. So the third lesson that I learned is find the person in charge. You could talk all the people you want, but always go find the person who make the decision. I could have talked and met with all the executives at Brandywine, and I've met a number of them before, but in the end, it was Jerry who will make the decision and who will be responsible for it. So all the other conversation almost didn't matter at that point. So that was a vital lesson that I learned as well. So hopefully you know the rest of the story from here. Uh, on Wednesday, April 19th, uh, we showcased the world's biggest pong for the first time. And on April 24th, we had over, uh, and again on April 24th, we had over 1,000 people sign up for the lottery to play the game of whom 150 were chosen to actually play during those two days. But in addition, which I loved, over thousands of people across the city saw the game. I don't mean on TV screen, on computer screen. They were walking on the street and they looked up and saw the game. I saw YouTube videos of people essentially uh, uh, taking uh, film from the, the river walk along the Schuylkill River. And frighteningly, I saw someone on I-76 as they were driving taking <laughs> film of the game and so on. Um, hopefully, it was a passenger and not the actual person itself. But um, in addition, we had over 400,000 views on YouTube. And my final word is that it seems people do care about Pong, even though it's old. Thank you.